Kentucky Governor Andy Beshear is only the third governor in state history to succeed himself. His lieutenant governor, Jacqueline Coleman, is also making history as the first female to be reelected as the state's second in command. A conversation with Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman. That's now on Connections. Thank you for joining us for Connections Today. I'm Renee Shaw. We know today's guest as the 58th Lieutenant Governor of Kentucky. Jacqueline Coleman's resume also includes being an educator, basketball coach, writer, and founder of a nonprofit. Lieutenant Governor Coleman joins me today to talk about the priorities of the second Bashir Coleman administration, what we can expect to see her take on in the next four years and what could come for her four years from now. I know she's been asked this a lot. Welcome, Lieutenant Governor. It's good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, the times we've been in the studio uh, four years ago, you were expecting. Yes. And, and now you have this wonderful little girl who mm -hmm. is getting ready for all the inauguration festivities as we talk and record this program. That's really uh, front and center for the administration right now. Yes, and um, you know we, we have a lot going on. Um, I'm primarily focused on getting this almost four-year-old <laughs> dressed and down those steps at the Grand March, uh, uh -huh. but she'll have a big time at the parade, and it's it's a great day um, for for Kentuckians, mm -hmm. and certainly um, it will be a little bit more familiar to us the second time around. Right, yes, you've done this before, so, but it doesn't mean that it's familiar, right? I mean, it's still exciting, it's still history making, yes. in so many ways, so much preparation. We were talking about that before we started recording about all the work that goes into this, because there's so many events and so many wardrobe changes and yes. all kinds of things. So. Right, and and I think about the, the folks behind the scenes mm -hmm. that bring this day to life. They make it so beautiful and so special for so many people and I'm just so grateful that we have so many talented artists and designers and and folks who can plan an event like I've never seen before mm -hmm. um, and lots of events in one day. That's right. So we're very fortunate here in Kentucky to right. have those great people. Well the good thing is is you're not doing a transition a formal transition right, right now as opposed to when you first came in office so that takes does that help take off some of the pressure right now? Absolutely. Um, you know you think about it the last time coming in I was a I was an assistant principal. Right. Um, I had no uh, no staff that had come together. The governor had, um, you know, the folks who had been in the attorney general's office with him to help, but we were putting together a whole new cabinet. Mm -hmm. We were putting together um, all those folks we needed in those key positions. And so this time we have all of that in place and it's a matter of making sure that we continue putting one foot in front of the other and producing for the, the folks of Kentucky. And also relishing the time, yeah. right? To take it in, which is hard to do when you're in the middle of all the planning, but to really realize like where you are mm -hmm. and the history that you're making. I mean, have you taken full stock of like the success of the administration and where you are in it? I, I try, it, it is overwhelming sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, someone who taught history, um, you know, I think about the moment and I think about making sure that you're present in that moment to take it all in. Um, but, but as you introduced me as the, the first woman in Kentucky's history mm -hmm. to be reelected as, as Lieutenant Governor, um, or Governor for that matter, right. Um, right. Uh, is, is it, it, it blows my mind some days to think about, and I think about, honestly, I say this a lot, but every day I walk into that Capitol, uh, the first thing I see is the Nettie Depp statue. Mm -hmm. It's the first female we've ever had in, in um, statue form in the Capitol. And then I get to see my name on the Lieutenant Governor door and I just think about how lucky I am. Right. Uh, and, and so I'm just so grateful to be able to enjoy this second inauguration day with all, all of our friends and family. And the campaign being behind you, what a relief I'm sure that was and is. Yes, uh, I think we're all glad to see those commercials go away. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> even, even, even us, even, even us. Even you all, yes, right? Yes, um, but it's, it's nice to put it behind us. I, mm -hmm. I'm proud of the race that we ran and um, I'm 
plan on being even more proud of the second half of this of this um, uh, service that we're providing to Kentucky. Right, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Yeah. Um, there's already been some attrition. We talked a little bit about yeah. transition, uh, not having a formal transition team, but we know the commissioner of uh, juvenile justice has stepped down. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is normal mm -hmm. that people will decide after a few years, okay, mm -hmm. I've had my fill. Do you expect there to be other folks who decide to move on? And, and can you reveal any of that? Well, we've announced a, a few, um, you know, vacancies folks were, were, you know, looking to fill in those, in those roles. One really exciting um, uh, piece of news is that uh, Colonel Jeremy Slinker, who was overseeing Kentucky Emergency Management, has actually been um, drafted into mm -hmm. FEMA. And so mm -hmm. he's gonna be working in the southern region of the country in that leadership role no doubt because of the leadership that he helped show here in Kentucky through some really trying times. And so we have some attrition, we have folks moving on to other things, we have folks who are deciding that um, they've they've put in their time of service and they're mm -hmm. ready to, to retire and, and move on to other things. And so it's just a really natural transition point for a lot of folks. Uh, but we're looking again to make sure that we fill those roles with the best people. And there are so many people who wanna be a part of Team Kentucky mm -hmm. uh, now, which is, is helpful in, in picking the best um, of the crop that we have here in Kentucky. And I'm really looking forward to helping folks to transition into these new roles, reimagining what they could be, and seeing how that fits into a second term for us. Right, what do you consider to be the crucial top challenge Challenge facing Kentucky now and how as you as lieutenant governor see yourself being a part of the change in a positive way you know I think that we are really at a crossroads now with um, our commitment to public education um, you know my dad was on on uh, in the in the state house he was on the education committee when CARA was passed so I have heard my entire life about how critical that that piece of legislation was to equalizing the state, to making sure that whether you're in Letcher County or Lincoln County, you can you can guarantee that your schools are funded um, adequately and equitably. And we've moved a long way from that. Um, and that's a big concern for me because right now, I think we are truly looking at a decision of, are we gonna recommit ourselves to public education in Kentucky to make sure every kid, no matter their zip code, has every opportunity that they can have? Or are we gonna look at going in a different direction that in my opinion would drastically harm our rural schools, our minority students, all of the kids that were benefited by CARA are the kids that, that we are at risk of losing if we fail to recommit to um, public education in the Commonwealth of Kentucky the way it needs to be. And we know as we are just a few days out from the 2024 legislative session that education is going to be a top priority of state lawmakers and school choice, mm -hmm. a possibly a, a constitutional amendment that they could, if they can, pass it themselves, put on the ballot for Kentucky voters to ratify in November about that. How active will the administration be against that uh, proposed constitutional amendment. He doesn't, the governor doesn't have the power to veto it because it's a constitutional amendment. But how full-throated uh, will you get behind the, the opposition to that? Well, you know, I think there is a real opportunity here. In, in my mind and the work that I've done my entire life in the classroom and as Lieutenant Governor, um, I've always believed that public education can and should be a bipartisan, nonpartisan issue. Um, it, it's truly about building uh, the best commonwealth, the best economy, investing in kids that need it. And that should be something that we should all be able to, to rally behind and get behind. And in my mind, we have two options here. Um, you know, if, if the General Assembly decides to move forward with uh, a constitutional amendment that would allow um, vouchers or charter schools or whatever, method they choose to move forward with, I think it's really important to note that the reason this is happening is because um, this law was struck down by the Supreme Court. They have tried time and time again to get something like this through and it's unconstitutional. So now they're looking at changing the Constitution. That's really hard to do. What's, what really is simple and the right thing to do is to make sure that every kid has access to the best education um, and I'm gonna fight for that every single day. I don't believe parents should have to take one more step 
to ensure that their kids are served the way that they need to be served. I think they should be able to put their kids on the school bus every morning, drop their kids off at school every day and know my kid is going to be treated equal, equally to every other child in Kentucky and we're giving our kids the best shot. And that's what I'm going to be vocal about. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to be working towards. And I don't care what party you're in. I don't care what elected title you have. I am willing to work with whoever mm -hmm. um, is committed to making that happen for our kids. Right. We also know that Kentucky kids face other challenges that are not just educational in scope. There had been reports of kids who were in out of home care, sleeping on state floor offices. Um, we, we, or state offices, the floor of state offices. When we think about all of the challenges facing Kentucky kids, mm -hmm. hunger, yeah. food insecurity, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunate abuse, and in environments when there's substance use, I mean, it's not just education. No. It's the entire environment of a mm -hmm. child that informs how well they do in school. Mm -hmm. Is the administration prepared to take on a more holistic approach at child welfare that could lead to better educational outcomes? As a teacher, I think about the whole child, right? So often mm -hmm. we refer to them as students right. and they're of course in desks and classrooms and all of those academic things. But the reality is a hungry kid um, is gonna be less likely to focus in, in school. A kid that has to go home to abuse or neglect is less likely to be focused in school. And that, that uh, negatively impacts the trajectory of that child's life. I'm also an adoptive mother. And so I have seen the struggles of our kids in our classrooms, whether they're in foster care, whether they're couch surfers, um, you know, whether they are coming from a home that um, may not be giving them everything they need. It impacts their learning, absolutely. But it also impacts their future family. And those are all of the pieces that we've got to make sure that we're putting together for our kids. Now that's a tall order, mm -hmm. hunger, and like you said, abuse and neglect, um, the best education possible. We've got to find a way to put that entire package together. And it's gonna take all of us, right? Um, it, it takes the village of people that we have in Kentucky to help bring those kids along and make sure they have what they need. That could be the, the guidance counselor at the school. It could be, um, their coach, it could be uh, an adult in their life, right? But it's gonna take all of us making sure that we prioritize every single segment of a child's life because we don't get to, uh, you know, dissect a child and say, well, we did this well, mm -hmm. but this, this, and this is is still not up to par. It's, a, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that all of our kids' needs are met to the best of our ability because that's what gives our kids the best outcome. Um, at the end of the day, it changes their future family's life. I've seen it with my own eyes. I know what it can do for a kid. And um, as Kentucky's highest elected mother, <laughs> that's something that I'm committed to making sure that we work towards every single day. Yeah. And as you know, you're working with a general assembly that is not of your party, mm -hmm. a super majority that they have. And this question has been asked many times about in a second term administration, um, you'll be termed out. What's the incentive for Republican lawmakers to work with your administration this time around? Why is it different? How are you working to make it different? And we've heard some of the Republican leadership say um, there's not an incentive to do things differently than in the previous four years. Yeah. What do you say and what do you hope for? Well, I say that incentive was made pretty clear on November 7th. Um, you know, Kentuckians elected a governor who puts people over politics. They elected a lieutenant governor who has worked in the classroom her entire life. Um, and, and this is what they asked for. They also asked for this general assembly. And so it's really incumbent upon all of us to find that common ground. Are we gonna agree on everything? Of course not. Um, but it really is important that we find the places where we can and we find those areas where we can move forward together um, and, and understand that there was a, a decision made by Kentuckians on November 7th that this is the administration that they wanted. They, they approved of disaster response. They approved of us being an education first administration. All of those things um, that we've been through together, Kentuckians said, we want four more years of that. That's an incentive, that, it, that should incentivize 
uh, the folks who are in the legislature to do the right thing for the right reasons and put politics aside. Um, that's what Kentuckians are asking for. That's what they deserve. Um, and that is certainly what the governor and I are committed to do. Are you all already talking now with Republican leaders about what you can agree on in 2024 during the session? Yes, and, and let me just say, I, I think the, the notion that the governor uh, and our administration doesn't work with the Republicans in the legislature was quite frankly an overblown campaign strategy. Um, the governor is in talks with um, the legislative leaders, folks in the office are too. Um, and, and we do that because we wanna make sure that we can find those shared priorities and move them forward. And you know, we've, we've done that. There may be some things that we may not be able to see eye to eye on, but there are certainly things that we can. To me, that should be the focus. Mm -hmm. And again, the governor and I rejected the culture war ideology. We rejected the notion that, that Kentuckians cared more about these manufactured culture wars than they do about jobs and healthcare and education. And we were right. And so um, to me, that's the signal of what Kentuckians want. And it's not a signal that the governor and I should get everything that we want, but it's also not a signal that the General Assembly should either. It's about coming together and working together. That's what people want at the end of the day. How active will you and the governor be as we come upon 2024? It's a big year, not just presidentially, but we have congressional seats and we have state legislative seats, which we watch yeah. very closely. So those contests will be up in 2024. How active will you be to make sure that maybe some of those red seats can flip to blue? Well, you know, we are going to have to see how all of this shakes out after the filing deadline in January mm -hmm. to see um, there will be some shuffling around. I think we've already seen some mm -hmm. legislators say that they're going to step down um, and, and move on to other work. Um, and so the, de the, the deck is still being shuffled right now. Right. So I think we still have to see kind of how that that plays out. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I can tell you this, I'm here to help anybody who'll support public education. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know the governor is gonna be looking at these races as well moving forward. Rocky Atkins, will he still serve as senior advisor to the governor? As far as I know. <laughs> so no changes at the, at the tippy top, right? Right, That right. you can foresee. Yeah, we've still got all of our, our leadership in place. Right. So as you know, um, and you know this question's coming, before 1995 there were four lieutenant governors, Martha Lane Collins, Steve Bashir, Bertrand Jones, and Paul Patton, they all moved into the governor's mansion. Since that time, Steve Henry, Steve Pence, Daniel Mangiardo, Jerry Abramson, Crit Lou Allen, and Janine Hampton, they did not move on to greater things in politics. What's going to be for you after these four years? Because you have to already decide sometime, given the fact that there was almost a $60 million race in 2023, in order to to build up a war chest in order to build up your profile even more than you have now? When will you decide and when will you announce that you'll run for governor of Kentucky? I've, I've never been one to plan so far ahead. I really do just try to make the next right decision. And that has led me to where I am today. And so I'd like to say that that's working uh, for me so far. So I really do try to take that next step, make the next right decision and, and see where it takes me. And so that's what I'll keep doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, that is, that's what leads me where I'm supposed to be. And you know, at my, my uh, dad used to say, you never wanna get too, out too far over your skis, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I'll keep doing. And when the time comes, I think the decision will be clear, but that time is not right now. Um, we've got so many things that we have to accomplish to finish up all of this, all, all of the progress we've made in this first term. And to me, that's what's gonna shape the second term. It's the legacy of the Bashir Coleman administration and making sure that we, we cement that and that we um, build off of this economic success, that we make sure that we keep prioritizing public education. Those are the things that have made us successful and those are the things that we're gonna keep focusing on and all that other stuff will come some other time. I just recall on election night, being on the other side of this studio and seeing the victory hold between you and the governor. And there were conversations about not just these four years, but the next four years for both of you, possibly national stage for the governor and possibly a bigger stage for you. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor, with all due respect, have you not <laughs> thought about being the state CEO? So this seat offers me a unique opportunity. It, it offers me a window into 
that that world, it offers me a seat beside the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, of course, I pay attention. Of course, I think about strategizing and I think about how I can help and assist and advise, and that's my job. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, you know, these are decisions that really shouldn't be made right now, in my mm -hmm. opinion, because the landscape of Kentucky is going to change. The landscape of the country is going to change. You never know what issue is going to creep up that you never saw coming. If anyone knows that, it's us. Um, and so again, it's really yeah. truly about making that next right decision, thinking about it, um, being mindful about it, but also keeping an open mind to, to opportunities out there. Yeah. For other young women who are watching you, and maybe they're not so young, yeah. you know, maybe they're middle-aged yeah. and they're in an advocacy space and they're wondering how they can make even more of a difference in a, maybe a political space. What would you advise them to do and not to do? Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I think about me being that woman, you mm -hmm. know, looking up to people like Critlow Allen and Martha Lane Collins and, and so forth and so on. And so to think of, of it, the shoe being on the other foot is still a new <laughs> concept to me. Um, but I think for women, I would, I would give the same advice I did when I founded Lead Kentucky. Our, um, our tagline was, find your passion, get involved and take the lead. And I would say the same thing for women who are, whether it's advocacy, whether it is um, elected office, mm -hmm. whether it is a leadership in a corporation, on a board, in whatever field you're in, um, we all have that passion that sparks in us. For me, it was public education, of course. So find a way to get involved in organizations, find a way to find those niches of people who uh, are, work on the same things you care about, get involved in those organizations, and once you're involved, don't be afraid to step out and take the lead. Um, I have uh, made some scary decisions in my life to run for office, not just this time, but of course in, mm -hmm. in the state house before. And I would not be where I am today had I not made those decisions, had I not stepped out, had I not been unsuccessful the first time, I wouldn't have been successful the second time. And so you never know where those decisions are gonna take you. And that's why I always say you try to make the next right one. Yeah. Um, but for women, I would say find your passion, get involved and take the lead, make that last step. Mm -hmm. We know that women are sometimes hesitant, mm -hmm. particularly to enter the political yeah. space and to take those leadership roles, even when it comes to corporate or nonprofit work, yeah. they second guess their Absolutely. ability. Do you second guess yourself? Every day. In what way? Every day. I think, uh, I think about um, me when I tell young women, don't let yourself succumb to imposter syndrome, <laughs> right? Easier said than done. Easier said than done. And so honestly, I have to check myself and say, if I, if I were talking to the younger me, what would I say right now? Um, and that's how I, I get myself out of that space. But it, it is um, sometimes so second nature for women to question themselves mm -hmm. or doubt. And I want women to know I do it every single day. Um, but then I think about what would I tell my younger self? And that's always the answer, right? It's always the answer when you think about in, inspiring young women and what you wished you had done in those roles. And when you have the opportunity, you gotta do it. Yeah. You don't doubt that you could be a governor, a good governor, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say I doubt myself uh, just in the day-to-day, day-to-day uh, mm -hmm. -day ways that are pretty common for women. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have loved this, this opportunity. I have loved this role. Um, and think about how I might be able to find myself in service mm -hmm. throughout this second term and in the future. Um, I probably will still doubt myself, <laughs> but I will always, always remember to do what I would tell my younger self to do. Yeah, just do it afraid, right? Right. You never get over That's that right. fear, you just do it afraid. That's right. And the time we have remaining, talking about women's issues, and uh, this is not just a women's issue, so I wanna say that first of all, yeah. but abortion, mm -hmm. and Kentucky's near total abortion ban, and you, your administration, uh, you and the governor, have, have been um, pretty adamant about support for exceptions. How much will you advocate for that in this upcoming session of the General Assembly? Well, I will say, you know, Kentucky voters have have asked and answered that question, right? I mean, they had an opportunity to vote on that con on the uh, amendment that was on the ballot, um, and rejected it. 
as did Kansas, as did Ohio. I could keep going. These are not bastions of liberalism, right? Um, these, are, these are people who say, you know, we've got to think about this. We've got young women who are victims of rape and incest. We have women young and middle-aged who, who suffer from uh, non-viable pregnancies every day. And we've got to be very careful with crafting policy around this issue because the, it is not black and white. It is very much a gray, uh, gray area issue um, and one that, quite frankly, I think young women like Hadley that mm -hmm. was in our commercial um, can speak much better about it than I can. Um, but I think truly Kentuckians mm -hmm. have, have asked and answered that question. It will, it will be interesting to see if the General Assembly takes notice of that or if they, if they choose not to listen mm -hmm. to the voters. Many people who've watched uh, the Kentucky governor's race, you know, said that the Hadley ad was the seminal moment yes. in the campaign. Do you believe that as well? I absolutely do. Um, I, I, that young woman, and I told her this when I met her, I said, you have more bravery in your pinky finger than most of us will ever have. And I thanked her for being brave enough to share her story. Um, I thanked her for uh, making sure that she was a voice for other young women who may have gone through something like this, who have been afraid to talk about it, who have been afraid to address it. She gave a voice and a face to an issue that so often women are told to be embarrassed about and told to hide. And to me, she changed the landscape of this conversation in Kentucky for the better because we centered women's voices in it. Yeah. Well, we thank you, Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman, for being here in person this time. We did this four years ago, and we <laughs> did it differently, but it's nice to sit across from you, and we appreciate your time, and we appreciate your service. Yes, thank you for having me. Best to you and the governor. Thank you for watching today. You can always keep in touch with us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. And you can also make sure that you watch us each weeknight for Kentucky Edition, 6.30 Eastern, 5.30 Central, where we connect, inform, and inspire. Know what's going on in your state, and you can by watching that program. Until I see you again, take really good care.